Danger was rehearsing a production of HMS Pinafore just before he left. A British tar is a soaring soul, as free as a mountain bird. His energetic fist should be ready to resist a dictatorial word. Sing, Worf, sing. Oh, come on. How is this not absolutely goddamn delightful? I don't even like Gilbert and Sullivan. I think some of y'all just need to lighten up a little. Learn to enjoy yourselves. Maybe then you'll start to see why Star Trek Insurrection is actually not that bad. I make no apologies. I like this movie. I've always liked this movie. Am I saying it's perfect? No. Am I saying it's great? No. Am I saying it's good? Yes. Yes. I'm saying it's good. It's not Wrath of Khan or Star Trek Beyond. Fight me, Kelvin haters. But Star Trek Insurrection is a good movie. That's not to say I don't understand why a lot of you don't care for it. I do. But we'll get to that. First, let's talk about what happens in the movie. So there's this planet. Seems like a nice place. Some people live here in a small village. They look like humans, but they're not. They're Baku. How many non-human species that look exactly like humans are there in Star Trek? I've lost count. Hey, you know who I bet would know? These guys. Starfleet anthropologists, or whatever, who are secretly studying the Baku from behind a cloaked duck blind. Because, as we learned in my video about the Prime Directive, interfering in the internal affairs of an alien society is bad, but spying on them from a few feet away without ever telling them you're there is just fine. Until the people you're spying on find out you're there, that is. Which is what always happens. Anyway, Date is here, and he's having a bad day. Something caused him to malfunction, and now he's just running all over the place in a cloaked isolation suit, pulling a bunch of invisible man gags. Eventually, he makes it over to the base of the duck blind and disables the cloak, revealing it to the entire village. Hello, Grandfather! How do you do? Meanwhile, on the Enterprise, they're getting ready for some diplomatic function, and Riker walks in and tells Picard that as soon as that's done, they have to go mediate a territorial dispute. And Picard kind of sighs and says, anyone remember when we used to be explorers? And all of us who used to watch the show are like, no, not really. Anyway, Worf's here. He's like, I know I'm on Deep Space Nine now, but the audience expects to see me, so here I am. Does anyone care about the specific reason? Does it matter? No? Good. Picard's having a great time at the diplomacy party when Geordi comes up and he's like, some admiral's on the phone for you? So Picard answers the phone and it's Admiral Dougherty and he's like, send us the specs for your android. He's going apeshit over here. It turns out Admiral Dougherty is on a ship belonging to the Sona who have partnered with Starfleet for a mission having something to do with the Baku. Dougherty is hanging out with the leader of the Sona, Ruafo, and he's like, boy, this whole Baku situation is all kinds of cocked up now, ain't it? And Ruafo is like, why don't we just kill them all? And Dougherty's like, what? And Ruafo is like, did I ever tell you I killed Mozart? Data's boosted a Starfleet scout ship, and he's flying around shooting at Ruafo's ship. The Enterprise shows up, and Dougherty calls Picard and says, Hey, dude, all I needed was Data's blueprints so we could turn him off or something. You didn't need to come all the way out here. I mean, it's not a problem. I'm not afraid you're going to discover anything or whatever, but, you know, seriously, get the hell out of here. But Picard insists that he be allowed to try and apprehend Data, and Dougherty's like, you've got 12 hours. So Picard and Worf jump into a shuttlecraft and fly out to catch Data. Picard tries to talk to him, but Data's not answering, so Picard thinks, well, if he doesn't want to talk, maybe he'll want to join me for a Gilbert and Sullivan duet. And that sort of works. While Data's distracted by the sing-along, Picard attaches his ship to Data's, and after Data almost crashes both ships trying to shake him off, Worf manages to get aboard Data's ship and turn him off with a remote control. Picard beams down to the Baku village with an away team to pick up the Starfleet and Sona crew who were stranded when Data took off with their ship, and he meets Anij and Sojef, who live in the Baku village. And they're like, hey, we tried to fix your android, but his memory was all messed up or something. And Picard's like, you rubes tried to repair Data? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> He's not a cotton gin, <laughs> you straw-chewing hicks. 
And so Jeff tells Picard, hey, we know all about technology and warp drive and shit. We just choose not to use any of it because leading a simple agrarian existence makes us feel morally superior to other people. Personally, I walked away from a really exciting life tracking down criminals for this gruff Los Angeles judge. I had an awesome car and a sweet perm. I heard after I left, the judge moved to Bajor. Jordy gets Data functioning properly again, but Data can't remember what happened to make him go haywire. So he and Picard go back to the planet to retrace his steps, and they find this cloaked ship in the middle of a lake. And inside the ship is a gigantic holodeck with an exact recreation of the Baku village. And Picard's like, I bet this isn't for anything good. And then Asona shows up and starts shooting at them, and Picard's like, yeah, see, that settles it right there. Something's definitely not right. Meanwhile, ever since the Enterprise showed up at the Baku planet, the crew has been unusually horny. Riker and Troy have started flirting with each other again. We even see them taking a bath together, where Troy shaves Riker's beard. What the hell are you people playing at? Getting rid of Riker's beard? In an odd-numbered Star Trek movie? That's like walking under a ladder on Friday the 13th, or talking about a no-hitter before the game is over, while within the radius of Mars, or texting while driving while also eating a piece of fish that hasn't been properly deboned, or... No, I think that's enough. Anyway, it's not just that the crew is feeling frisky. Worf's got a humongous Klingon pimple. People's boobs are firming up. Geordi's eyes finally grow in. Picard just up and busts out into a mambo. And then he's like, that was weird. So he goes back down to the planet and drops in on Anish and asks her what the hell is going on. And she says, oh, did we forget to mention that this is the Eternal Youth Planet? Yeah, it's something to do with the radiation coming from the rings, regenerates our cells or something. We're all like hundreds of years old. Say, you don't think this has anything to do with why there was an invisible hollow ship with an exact copy of our village parked in the lake, do you? Later back on the Enterprise, Dowardy and Ruafo march into Picard's ready room like, why were you messing with our secret hollow ship? And Picard's like, I got a better question. Why were you gonna use the hollow ship to abduct the Baku? Cause that's totally what you were planning to do, right? And Dowardy says, dude, you're making a big deal out of nothing, okay? Yes, we were gonna secretly relocate the Baku somewhere else, but, but, A, who decided they should be immortal, and B, the Sona, my buddies, have a condition that only the anti-aging properties of the planet can cure. And once we figure out how to help them, we can use the same process to help people all over the galaxy. So actually, what we're doing is a good thing even though in order to collect the anti-aging radiation, we will have to render the entire planet uninhabitable, so there's that, but small price to pay, right? And Picard gives Dougherty a classic Picard speech about how forcibly relocating populations is bad, no matter how good of a reason you think you have, and it doesn't matter if you're talking about a few hundred people like the Baku, or a thousand people, or a million, you're still a dick, and I'm not gonna let you get away with it. And Dougherty's like, well, the Federation Council is on my side, so I'd like to see you try. So Picard takes most of the other important cast members down to the planet and they evacuate the village and march everybody into the mountain so the Sona can't get to them. Meanwhile, Riker and Geordi leave on the Enterprise to go blow the whistle on what a shit show this whole Baku Sona situation has turned into. Picard and a bunch of the others end up getting captured by the Sona anyway. Beverly figures out that the Sona and the Baku are actually the same species, only the Sona left the Eternal Youth planet a long time ago and have been deteriorating ever since, which is why they're in such bad shape now. By now, even Admiral Dougherty is starting to have second thoughts about this, so Ruafo kills him with a face-stretching chair, which is a thing he has. Then Ruafo says, you know what? I'm making this way more difficult than it has to be. I have a new plan, and my plan is so simple. First, I must get the death mass, and then I must achieve his death. Ruafo second in command Gallatin is like, what the hell are you talking about? And Ruafo says, I'm just gonna deploy the eternal youth radiation collector while the rest of those people are on the planet. That way I'll get what I want, and they'll all die, so I'll get what I want. And Gallatin's thinking, okay, if he's gonna kill everybody, I can't get behind that. So Gallatin springs Picard from where he's being held with the rest of the prisoners, and together they hatch a plan to stop Ruafo. And that's what they do. 
With help from Worf and Data, who weren't captured, they beam Ruafo and the rest of his crew onto a simulation of their bridge aboard the hollow ship. But Ruafo figures it out and manages to beam himself over to his eternal youth radiation collector so he can just do what he needs to do manually. Picard realizes what he's trying to do, so he beams over to the Collector 2 and has a fight with Ruafo, and he's like, why you gotta be like this, man? And Ruafo's like, because you are unjust, unfair, unkind. I will block you. I swear it. I will hinder and harm your creature as far as I am able. Mm, that one doesn't really work, does it? The bit about the creature doesn't make sense in this context. Okay, do you have any idea how hard it is to work quotes from goddamn Amadeus into a summary of a Star Trek movie? Good point. I'm gonna activate the self-destruct now. And Picard activates the self-destruct, and right before it blows him up real good, the Enterprise swoops in and beams him out. And Ruafo dies engulfed in flames and screaming. Just like Salieri. I assume. And that's pretty much it. The Baku return to their village. The Sona are welcomed home. Picard and Anish have kind of become friends, wink wink, and Picard promises to come back and visit next time he takes shore leave. Data is shown playing in a pile of hay with one of the kids from the village to tie up a cutesy subplot they had going. The crew beams back to the Enterprise, the ship sails away into the distance, and the old human adventure continues. So what's so great about this movie? That's not the issue. I already told you, this video is about why Insurrection is not that bad, not why Insurrection is great. Don't you try to move the goalposts on me, you lousy cheats. Let's look at some of the things the movie does and doesn't do. First, it lightens things up. I love First Contact, but it is kind of grim. And I don't want Star Trek, particularly The Next Generation, the most optimistic of all the Trek shows, to be a gritty action franchise. That's nice every once in a while, but if I wanted to see that sort of thing all the time, I'd watch, I don't know, the Battlestar Galactica reboot, which was excellent. What I saw of it anyway, I don't think I ever made it all the way through the first season. It was good. I just got distracted by something else that I found more interesting. I can't remember what. Probably old episodes of Star Trek. Second, it gives every character in the main cast a chance to do things other than fight scenes or comic relief. Like all the TNG movies, this is mostly the Picard and Data show, but the other members of the Enterprise crew each get at least a scene to shine. Jordy has that scene on the planet after his eyes grow in where he's watching a sunrise for the first time. Riker and Troy have their romantic subplot. Worf gets a moment with Riker near the end when Riker wonders if his rekindled relationship with Troy will last, and Worf is like, your feelings for each other haven't changed as long as I've known you two. Which is a nice reminder that Riker and Worf are, you know, friends. And okay, a lot of that is well-trodden ground at this point, but it's better than randomly distributing expository dialogue so everyone gets a line. Oops. Sorry, Bev. Would it really have been that difficult to give Dr. Crusher something meaningful to do? In one of the TNG films? Four movies and her most memorable contributions are getting shoved overboard by Data and turning on the holographic Doctor and running away. Third, it uses Picard as something other than an action hero. Yes, he's an action hero too, but Picard as we see him in Insurrection is as close as he gets in the films to the character he is on the TV series. He cares about the plight of the Baku, even before he starts crushing on Anij, like he's some kind of principled person or something. He angrily objects to Admiral Dougherty and Ruafo's relocation plan, calling it a betrayal of the values of the Federation. The values that the Federation is supposed to stand for mean something to Picard. And we see that in this movie, and it's a welcome reminder that he can do things besides shoot bad guys and rant theatrically about revenge. Fourth, the film has political content, and sadly evergreen political content at that. One of the big complaints about the Star Trek movies, particularly the Next Gen and Kelvin timeline films, is that they're primarily action movies lacking the social conscience that sets Star Trek apart from other popular sci-fi franchises. 
Not the case with Insurrection, which has obvious, painful parallels to, as Picard says at one point, some of the darkest chapters in the history of our world. Chapters which involved the forced relocation of a small group of people to satisfy the demands of a large one. Fifth, there's no threat to Earth. I get why the writers of sci-fi and superhero movies feel like there needs to be a threat to Earth to hook the audience. I mean, it's Earth. We're all pretty attached to it. Okay, maybe not all of us. But you can tell a compelling story without the fate of Earth, or the fate of the galaxy, or the fate of the universe hanging in the balance. The stakes in Insurrection aren't as epic as in First Contact, or Nemesis, or Generations. Now that I think about it, there are 230 million people living in the Viridian system, which Soren intends to destroy in order to reach the Nexus. In Insurrection, all that's at stake are the lives of 600 or so Baku and the principles of the Federation. But that's plenty. If our characters care about achieving a particular outcome, and we care about the characters, that's all we need. Or it's all I need, anyway. I'm in the minority here. When Star Trek Insurrection opened in theaters in December 1998, it was met with mixed reviews from fans and critics. It had a good opening weekend, but ultimately grossed about $30 million less than First Contact, and wound up as one of the worst performing Star Trek films at the box office. And I get it. Not everybody's as big of an F. Murray Abraham mark as I am. Plus, Insurrection came out just two years after First Contact, and it's a very different movie. People who loved First Contact for being diehard on a starship probably didn't turn out to see Insurrection hoping for a morality play with jokes. In fact, a lot of folks hate the jokes. Not me. I think Insurrection has some of the funniest scenes in any Star Trek movie. The HMS Pinafore sing-along, Worf smashing the Sona drone with his phaser rifle, then turning wild-eyed to Picard and shouting, DEFINITELY FEELING SOME AGGRESSIVE TENDENCY, SIR! Riker bragging to Data that his freshly clean-shaven face was smoother than an android's bottom, then Data feels it for himself and is like, I don't think so, brother. And yes, I like the flotation device gag too, okay? Everybody hates it. I think it's funny. It's goofy, but it works in the situation. Spiner sells the line, and the visual of Data rising up out of the water and bobbing gently back and forth makes me laugh. The only joke that doesn't work for me is the Enterprise's manual steering column. It feels like an attempt to connect with the kids in the audience, thought up by the most out-of-touch adult in the writer's room. Which is exactly what it is. After Insurrection underperformed, the producers decided that for the next film, the franchise needed to be reinvigorated. Even though Jonathan Frakes had done a fine job helming First Contact and Insurrection, they pulled him from the director's chair and hired Stuart Baird. They also hired Academy Award nominee John Logan as the writer. The movie they wound up making, the final movie to feature the cast of The Next Generation, was Star Trek Nemesis. And what's puzzled me about that movie ever since I saw it is why, after bothering to bring in fresh blood like Baird and Logan, they decided to just remake Insurrection without the jokes. I'll explain. Both films introduce the Enterprise crew at a social function. In Insurrection, it's the diplomatic reception. In Nemesis, it's the wedding of Riker and Troy. In both films, the big action scene is the result of the crew investigating a mystery relating to Data. In Insurrection, it's Data attacking the duck blind at the Baku village. In Nemesis, it's the discovery of the disassembled android who turns out to be Data's long-lost brother. In both films, the villains are driven by a desire to save or liberate their own people. Ruafo wants to cure the Sona of the condition that is slowly killing them. Shinzon wants to liberate and empower the Remans. Both villains at first appear to have larger, more altruistic goals, only to have their true, selfish motives revealed. The initial justification for Ruafo's plan is not only to cure the Sona's condition, but then, according to Admiral Dougherty, use the same de-aging technology to help other people. But Ruafo ultimately abandons that to take revenge against the Baku. Shinzon, a clone of Picard, claims he wants to befriend Picard so that he can better understand himself and pursue an 
alliance between his new Romulan government and the Federation, but it turns out he just needs Picard's blood, and also he has an ultimate weapon that he wants to use to destroy the Federation. Both villains have degenerative conditions they are trying to cure at any cost. Both villains have weapons capable of wiping out all life on an entire planet. Both weapons take time to be deployed, resulting in ticking clock scenarios. In both films, the good guys win with help from a former bad guy, Gallatin in Insurrection, Commander Denatra in Nemesis. In both films, the Enterprise battles hostile ships in a region of space with properties that block subspace communications and make calling for reinforcements impossible, the Briar Patch in Insurrection, the Bassin Rift in Nemesis. In both films, Picard beams over to an enemy ship to try and stop the weapon from being deployed, leading to a climax climactic one-on-one -on -one fight with the main villain. In both films, Picard is beamed away to safety moments before the enemy ship is destroyed. What does this have to do with Insurrection not being that bad of a movie? I don't know. Nothing, I guess. It's just always bugged me how Insurrection was regarded as a failure and proof that the franchise needed freshening up, and then they up and make a movie that is structurally very similar to Insurrection, only grim and boring and just generally a lot worse, and most people don't even seem to notice. There is some small consolation, however. Remember I said Insurrection was one of the worst performing Star Trek movies at the box office? Guess what the worst is? Didn't even gross enough domestically to cover its budget. No wonder Paramount just said, screw it, we're going back to Captain Kirk. Anyway, I'm not expecting this video to change anyone's mind who came in thinking Insurrection was the shits. Opinions vary, and one's taste in movies is a very personal thing, determined just as much by an individual's own experience and point of view as by the movie itself. And as I've said a couple of times already, I get why a lot of you don't like the movie. The silly humor and relatively low stakes don't appeal to everyone, and the plot does often feel derivative of episodes of TNG, particularly Who Watches the Watchers, which introduces the concept of Starfleet using cloaked duck blinds to secretly observe societies. Homeward, which features a plan to use the holodeck to relocate a native population without them knowing it, and a migration across the countryside, and Journey's End, which shows us Picard grappling with the morality of forcibly relocating a population. All I can tell you is those things don't bother me. I enjoy the humor for the most part. I kind of like the smaller stakes, and the derivative plot and the other flaws I've mentioned here and there don't really occur to me when I'm watching the movie. I acknowledge they're there, but I don't really care. When I watch Star Trek Insurrection, I have a good time. It's not a life-changing cinematic experience, but it's a solid, likable Star Trek movie. It's got some funny bits, some nicely observed character moments, a touch of political commentary, and well-executed, if not terribly creative, action sequences. In fact, well-executed but not terribly creative is a good way to describe the movie in general. It ain't Wrath of Khan, but it makes me happy. As happy as Worf right after he smashes that drone? But happy enough. Hey folks, well, there you go. That's the Star Trek Insurrection episode of Trek Actually. Hopefully you found it entertaining, and maybe some of you who don't like that movie at least now have a bit of an understanding as to why I do like it, and some of our other fellow Star Trek fans might like that movie more than you do. I'm gonna let you know what the subject of the next Trek Actually video is going to be in just a minute, but first, I've got some shout-outs for a few of my newest Patreon patrons. These are patrons who just joined the Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash steveshives and are pledging at a level of $5 a month or more. $5 a month or more gets you a shout out at the end of Trek Actually, just like these folks. And their names are Michael Nittle. Thank you, Michael. Jason Nebergall. Thank you, Jason. Dale Andrew Darling. Thank you, Dale. Nicholas Gross. Thank you, Nicholas. John McGowan, thank you, John. 
Crystal of Truth. Thank you, Crystal of Truth. Matt Dancer. Thank you, Matt. Brandon Enright. Thank you, Brandon. Ryan Burford. Thank you, Ryan. Michael Scott. Thank you, Michael. Angela Weaver. Thank you, Angela. Sunil. Thank you, Sunil. Jemshin. Thank you, Jemshin. Lori Faith G. Thank you, Lori Faith. Elizabeth Fricker. Thank you, Elizabeth. Wayne Twitchell. Thank you, Wayne. Jesse S. Thank you, Jesse. Michael Hogan. Thank you, Michael. Eric Beyer. Thank you, Eric. Zayfod 2073. Thank you, Zayfod 2073. Porter Bella. Thank you, Porter Bella. Tim. Thank you, Tim. Nick Pollard. Thank you, Nick. Isaiah Taylor. Thank you, Isaiah. Mark Gozdzik, thank you, Mark. Danny K, thank you, Danny. C.R. Barboni, thank you, C.R. Paul Meta, thank you, Paul. And Ashy Crowned Sparrow Larks, thank you, Ashy. Thanks to all of my newest $5 or more per month Patreon patrons, and thanks to all of you who are patrons, however much you're pledging, and however long you've been pledging. I could not do this without your support. You have my everlasting gratitude. I thank you so much for enabling me to keep doing this thing that I do. If you want to help me continue to do it, you can go to patreon.com slash Steve Shives. And for a pledge of anything, $1 per month or more, you not only become a supporter of this channel, but specifically related to Trek Actually, you get to vote in the polls that choose the topics of future Trek Actually videos. That is open to all patrons of this channel from $1 per month all the way on up to however much you can afford and however much you think I'm worth. Now, before I tell you the subject of the next Trek Actually video, I want to remind you that if you dig the Star Trek stuff that I do on this channel, I'm also the co-host of a Star Trek-themed comedy podcast along with the great Jason Harding. It's called The Ensign's Log. Jason and I play characters in the podcast. We play low-ranking officers who are serving aboard a certain famous Federation starship as it embarks on a certain legendary five-year mission. I think you can connect the dots. If you dig Trek Actually and you haven't listened to the Ensign's Log, I highly recommend that you check it out. I think you'll really, really like it. The links are in the description below this video. You can subscribe via RSS using your favorite podcast app. You can listen on the website. You can listen on SoundCloud. Check out the Ensign's Log now. The moment that those of you who are still watching have been waiting for. The subject of the next Trek Actually video that will come out in about a month from now will be chosen by my patrons in the most recent poll, how do the economics of Star Trek actually work? And this topic won that poll in a landslide. It was 30 points ahead of the second place finisher. So a lot of people are really interested in this subject. And I am too. In fact, for the first time ever for a Trek Actually video, the research for writing the video has involved more than just watching Star Trek episodes. I've, I've had to read a couple of books. There have been actually a couple of really interesting books written by like proper economists about the economics of Star Trek and how the economics of the Federation work. So hopefully this will be a really interesting and fun video we can examine and how the economics of the Federation uh, are supposed to work in Star Trek, how Federation society is arranged to a certain extent, how the Federation is able to interact and trade with other societies that are still using money, even though the Federation is not using money by the time we get to the next generation. So lots of stuff to cover. Hopefully it'll be an informative and fun video. How do the economics of Star Trek actually work? That's next time. The poll for the month after that will go up in a few hours after this video goes up. So everybody who is a patron or thinking about becoming a patron, go check uh, patreon.com slash Steve Shives in a little bit and a few hours after this video goes live and you can vote in the poll for the Trek Actually video after the next one. That should be a fun one too. So, okay, I think that's it. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the Insurrection video. Uh, I'll see you next month for the Economics of Star Trek video. And in the meantime, we'll throw in a Not Actually Trek actually hear about something or other. So <laughs> I'll see you soon, everybody. Take care. Thanks for watching. <laughs>